The Philadelphia Church of God presents The Trumpet Daily. everyone. Welcome back to the Trumpet Daily. Well, as you can see here with the set, we've had to move things around just a little bit. The uh, next 10 to 12 days, we're going to be going through quite a few rehearsals here on stage for the upcoming uh, musical produced by Ryan Malone, David, The Endless Throne Begins. The first performance is open to the general public on December 26th, and then the second showing is on the 28th, and the third and final viewing is on December 29th. You can go to armstrongauditorium.org and uh, get your own tickets and reserve your own seats uh, for any of those three performances for just $8. So that's at armstrongauditorium.org. Hopefully in the next week we'll be able to uh, show you some clips of uh, Mr. Malone himself, the, the producer, the writer of that uh, musical, and uh, also give you a few other uh, tidbits uh, about the preparations in uh, the lead up to the performance. So you can look forward to that, hopefully on uh, the Trumpet Daily. Uh, also, we've um, uh, added a few monitors to our set, not yet in place, but uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks we'll have a few more pieces to add to our, our Trumpet Daily set here on the stage of Armstrong Auditorium. So uh, quite a few things here uh, to look forward to in the weeks ahead. All right, I just want to try to bring, uh, bring you up to speed with a few um, significant events that I think are worth uh, drawing attention to. Um, this article by James Lewis, uh, how President Obama ran down the nuclear doomsday clock. Herbert W. Armstrong used to talk about this doomsday clock uh, that is ticking. And uh, as Mr. Lewis in his recent column points out, uh, it is uh, fast coming to midnight. And what he says in his article that I think was particularly effective was just how fast these momentous events in the world can happen. I mean, it can seem like things are, are going slowly, 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 but then all of a sudden, there's this earth-shaking event. Here's what Mr. Lewis writes. In world affairs, huge changes can happen quickly after explosive cracks in the structure of peace build and build over decades. He says the Arab Spring destroyed 30 year stable governments from Tunisia and Libya to Egypt and Yemen with Saudi Arabia itself now under huge pressure to crack. So there were these peaceful or this peaceful period for three decades. And then all of a sudden they're at the start of 2011, beginning with just one one individual protester in Tunisia, who set himself on fire. We wrote about that back in January, January 19th, 2011, and pretty much prepared you for what would happen right across the region. Mr. Hilliker, Joel Hilliker wrote, just this week, this is from January 2011, keep in mind, he says, just this week, revolutionary explosive events have rocked that region, and no one quite knows how things will end up on the other side. Some Western observers hope this signals a new era of democracy, liberalization, and freedom there. In a sense, that is a likely outcome. But if the past decade has proven anything, it is the error of the notion that greater democracy and freedom in this part of the world produce peaceful results. The spread of democracy in the Middle East, he says, hasn't produced peaceful results. And then later on in his article, he talked about how this man who set himself on fire, in a sense, he wrote, he may have lit the whole region on fire. Now, we were certainly uh, right about that because as soon as that happened, uh, what was it, a week or two later, when Egypt went up in flames, and then really it just spread right across uh, the region. And you can't look at the Middle East today and say that these uprisings all across the region, the Middle East and, and Northern Africa, you can't look at that region and say that it's a, a more peaceful place because of it. It's made the Middle East and the world much, much more dangerous. That's just one region. Uh, continuing in Mr. Lewis's piece, he says the Soviet empire 
crumbled in only a year or two after 70 years of increasing power supported by a domestic reign of terror. China did so likewise. Today, North Korea could collapse in a matter of weeks. He says under President Obama, Pax Americana is now being dismantled piece by piece all around the world. Japan is rearming because they can see the writing on the wall. China is making fast imperialistic grabs before the next U.S. president comes to office. He says transnationalist power classes everywhere are celebrating the era of Obama, not understanding that great destruction will come before any new international order and that transnational elites are not likely to win against Chinese, Russian, Iranian, and Sunni imperialism, all armed to the teeth with weapons of mass destruction, he says. All of these movements, all of these regions, all of these nations, armed to the teeth, he says. Those, as we've pointed out recently in, in Trumpet Dailies, those celebrating the decline of the United States, they don't see the great destruction that's coming, the great destruction that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24, where he said, For then shall be great tribulation, great tribulation, the likes of which this world has never seen. Christ said that if God didn't intervene, that man would actually destroy himself. I mean, that's a prophecy that was only able to be uh, fulfilled in these latter days when uh, we have the, the weaponry, the power, the arsenal to kill off ourselves with nuclear weapons and such. Never, never will the world see anything uh, or has it seen anything like what's coming, like what's just ahead of us. If not for God's intervention, as I say, there would be no hope for our future. Look around you at this world. The world is, is becoming an armed camp. Even as the United States downsizes and cuts back its army, its navy, its, its nuclear arsenal, the rest of the world is stockpiling weapons. It's becoming an armed camp. I want to go through a few verses in 1 Thessalonians 5 if you'd like to read along and read here what, what the Apostle Paul said about just how fast major events can happen. He said sudden destruction is coming. It's all going to happen so fast, so quickly, just like Mr. Lewis brings out in, uh, in his article, just to give you one more quote uh, from there before we read 1 Thessalonians. Lewis said, Our liberal foreign policy elites are deaf, dumb, and blind. Of course, there's other prophecies in the Bible that, that speak of that the blind leaders, the blind leading the blind, he says, which happens often to brain-locked elites before they crumble. He said, before the disaster of World War I, the British, French, Russian, and Austro-Hungarian empires were filled with arrogance and self-glorification. He says, then they fell apart in the industrialized trench warfare that destroyed a whole generation in Europe, bringing the United States to world preeminence for the first time. That's following after World War I, and we entered into the era of American dominance. And as we've been pointing out repeatedly in recent weeks, that era is now over. We've now entered into the post-American world. The question is, what happens next? Where do we go from here? 1 Thessalonians 5, in verse 1 it says, But of the times and of the seasons, Brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. He's writing to God's people, the Apostle Paul in Thessalonica, and uh, pointing out that God's people should be informed as to what's really important and significant in world affairs. I mean, there are other scriptures that talk about us not knowing the specific day or the hour, but, but Jesus said that you can know if you'll study God's word if you'll draw near to God in prayer, you can know when it's near, when it's even at the door, when it's close, in other words. Verse 2, it says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. You see, this is talking about when God will, uh, just like Matthew 24 says, when God will supernaturally intervene in the affairs of men. And he says there that it's going to happen at an unexpected hour 
when people, generally speaking, in the world, least expect it. Just like you would not expect a thief coming in the middle of the night. Verse 3 says, For when they shall say, notice this, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. You see, sudden destruction. Mr. Lewis, in his article, talked about huge changes that just happen quickly. And we've seen that happen, as he points out with those examples. The, the fall of the Soviet Empire. I mean, that happened suddenly. And they've almost just as, as quickly uh, risen back to power. The Middle East, the dramatic changes that have happened there just in the last two or three years. These are sudden, transformative events that have changed this world. And it's all leading and building, as Paul says here, to this great catastrophe, this sudden destruction that's going to sweep right across uh, the earth. The Bible re repeatedly refers to this end time uh, sudden destruction that's going to take man, the civilization of man, right to the very brink. Luke 21, you can also look at in the Gospels, where Jesus said there that it's going to catch us like a snare like a trap that springs on its prey, just suddenly, at an instant, the prophet Isaiah compared it to this high swelling wall that's just going to uh, break suddenly and at an instant, it says. Sudden destruction, that's what Christ associates uh, these end time events or those events leading to his return uh, with. It comes at a time, like I said, when people least expect it. Going back to Mr. Lewis, his piece, it says, History will see uh, President Obama not as the, the Messiah of the age of uh, Aquarius, but as the last doomed empress of the West, performing her ritual dance to the warm applause of the imperial court while outside the walls, grinning legions of barbarians are preparing to strike down the whole empire. That's the way history will, will record what's happening right now. Even as we wine and dine, enemies are just outside the walls and they're, they're waiting to strike. Verse 4, it says, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. I mean, if you know God's truth, you can prepare for what's ahead. As I pointed out earlier, I mean, on January 19th in, in 2011, we... We told you pretty much where that, that lone protester in Tunisia, what that would lead to. How that it would set off a fire throughout the region. And look at the Middle East today, some three years on. You can know the truth. Verse 6, it says, Therefore let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. God says to you, he says to me, he says to all of us, be alert, be spiritually alert. Watch, watch unto prayer, it says over in 1 Peter 4. Watch, be sober, keep awake spiritually, be on guard so that you're prepared, so that you're ready for what's ahead. All right, we'll be right back in just a few moments. In 1945, the detonation of the atomic bomb in Japan brought an end to World War II with overwhelming force. This new technology ended the worst war man had ever experienced, but with it came a new, dangerous age. The age of atomic and nuclear energy had arrived, accompanied by weaponry capable of destroying all life on Earth. Man's number one problem now became that of human survival. After signing the Japanese surrender, General MacArthur spoke to America and the world about peace, and with it he brought a grim warning. He said, Men since the beginning of time have sought peace. Military alliances, balances of powers, leagues of nations, 
all in turn failed, leaving the only path to be by way of the crucible of war. The utter destructiveness of war now blots out this alternative. We have had our last chance. If we will not devise some greater and equitable system, our Armageddon will be at our door. Referring to the last days of this present age, Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 22, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. The threat of nuclear annihilation is knocking on the world's door while man continues his desperate search for peace without results. Your Bible promises a means of protection from soon coming war, but it also pictures a bright future in which war will finally be abolished and in which a real lasting peace will flourish. How can you find your way to the peaceful world to come and avoid the results of impending war? These questions need answers. Visit thetrumpet.com Request your copy of our free booklet, We Have Had Our Last Chance. Last week we produced a program titled The Truth about Nelson Mandela and South Africa and that video which you can uh, find at thetrumpet.com. It, it generated quite a large response. Quite a few people uh, watched it. Uh, many were thankful to, to hear something, to see something that they just hadn't seen uh, anywhere else, uh, certainly not in the mainstream media. Quite a few uh, others were also uh, quite upset by that truth, the true, the true story of what's happening in South Africa today. Yesterday at thetrumpet.com, we, we posted a follow-up article to this story uh, titled, Malima Vows to Continue Mandela's Militant Legacy. Now, Julius uh, Malima is a popular South African politician um, who uh, loves to sing about killing white people, killing off uh, the, the whites. In fact, he was, he was chanting that even as, as dignitaries were arriving at the memorial service uh, last Tuesday. You might remember, if you've read our material for very long, uh, Robert Morley's article from back in 2010 when he wrote about Malima's uh, love for racist uh, songs, uh, Killing the Boar and, and Bring Me My Machine Gun, uh, as the lyric goes. This is from that article that we posted yesterday um, by Mr. Andrew Miller. He talked about Malima leading a crowd of uh, followers to Mandela's house after the the ceremony last week. During his speech, uh, Miller writes, Malima recounted how most people chose to remember Mandela as he was after his release from prison in 1994, rather than focusing on his early years as a militant leader in the struggle against apartheid. He promised to speak more about Mandela's early years in the near future. And then in, in the article, it quotes Malima saying, people are distorting Nelson Mandela today. They're distorting the history. Viva the militant Nelson Mandela. Viva, this Malima says. And even he acknowledges the militant legacy of Nelson Mandela, who happened to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Mr. Miller writes, now the, that Mandela is gone, Malima told his followers the economic freedom fighters uh, will take up his struggle. Thank you, uh, Mandela, for ushering in political freedom, he said. Those who uh, came after you failed to deliver economic freedom. We are picking up this battle. We salute Raul Castro. We salute President Mugabe. We have no business saluting Prime Minister uh, of Britain, David Cameron. We don't care about him. We're not going to salute him. We're going to salute these communist regimes, these thugs ruling in Africa. He's a committed communist himself who happens to sing about killing white people. And yet there's virtually no outrage and not even much to speak of in South Africa where the white people are being killed in alarming numbers, really. 
Yesterday there was an article by uh, Selwyn Duke uh, at the American Thinker about whitewashing the, the uh, memory of Mandela. He writes, 20 whites a day are murdered in South Africa and the total killed since 1994 currently amounts to more than 70,000. Since 1994, so you can do the math, that's about 20 years, 70,000 whites have been killed. He says, and we made this point last week, he says, in fact, the world's most dangerous profession is now that of Boer, white Afrikaner uh, farmer, with a murder rate of 310 per 100,000. Now he makes this comparison, note this, 310 per 100,000, and he says the homicide rate in London is three per 100,000, three per 100,000. And in South Africa, it's 310. Not surprisingly, he writes, where South Africa boasted 128,000 commercial farmers in 1980, the number has now been whittled down to 40,000. 40,000. So over two-thirds. I mean, I'm sure some of them have fled the country, but that's an alarming, alarming number an alarming reduction. He says, if that sounds to you like it's knocking on genocide's door, you're not alone. The respected organization, Genocide Watch, places white South Africans in the sixth stage of the genocidal process. He says, there are only seven stages, by the way, with the last, the next for South African whites, being extermination. They're on the sixth step to uh, extermination in the seven step process. He says, if you're shocked that you haven't heard anything about this, don't be. It's even less politically correct to talk about the extermination of whites than that of Christians who are currently persecuted in many Muslim lands. The South Africa police often aren't interested in investigating crimes against whites, especially since they perpetrate some of them. And the Western media uh, were only concerned about reporting on South African whites when they could be demonized. And the press certainly won't find its honest pen now in the midst of its effort to beatify the recently deceased Nelson Mandela. This brings me to my main point, he says. Mandela, this, this great man of peace, never had much to say about the impending genocide of whites. Now, Mr. Duke goes on and, and writes about these many South African leaders like Malima, uh, Jacob Zuma himself, the president, proudly sings this popular song about killing the whites. And here again, they're basically given a, a, a free pass. I want to show you, he mentions there how that even Mandela himself had virtually nothing to say about this impending genocide. I want to show you this clip of Mandela himself singing along, or at least humming along with... Uh, uh, a group of South Africans singing this popular song, Kill the Whites. You can uh, see that in the subtitles on this clip. Uh, and then as, as soon as he's done singing, just notice how as he switches to English, notice uh, the content of uh, his comments right after uh, singing that song. We'll show the clip and come right back for some closing remarks. Mr. Mandela, K 
Can you tell us how you feel visiting this spot at this time? It is a very emotional moment for us. That those who are fighting for democracy, for peace, for love among South Africans, should be mowed down by those who feel, who fear democracy. Peace, democracy and love amongst South Africans are fine words in English. But the Koso words of the just sung song just don't tally. How does one who speaks Kosa and English explain away the contradiction between what the people sing from the very depth of their hearts in Kosa and what is declared or volunteered in English? Now you can notice there at the end of that clip how the reporter um, even is concerned about this contradiction between uh, what they sing in their tribal tongues and what they then say right after that in English. How do you explain this contradiction? It's a difficult contradi contradiction to explain. And you see the, the same contradiction really in radical Islam, you know, these, these terrorist groups that say one thing in Arabic and then give you the smooth words of peace and uh, democracy and love. That's what Mandela said there after singing that, that song. Peace, democracy and love. Now, how, if you think about the mainstream media, obviously the, the, the liberal appeasers on the left, they have quite a monopoly on the mainstream news, but it's not like you can't get to the truth, particularly with the technology of today. If you're just willing to dig a little bit, you can go and see. You can see what people say in their own words, their own speeches, their own songs, their own interviews. If you're just willing to do a little bit of digging, and of course we have plenty of literature for you to help steer you in the right direction, as I said, that program we did last week, it got quite a number of responses, quite a few people who, uh, who got online at thetrumpet.com and requested this little booklet, South Africa in Prophecy. We are without excuse. Of course, there's a, a, a politically correct message that goes out there in the mainstream that really obscures the truth. But if you're diligent, if you put in the effort if you're serious about learning the truth, and, and as I covered in 1 Thessalonians 5 earlier, knowing what's ahead, you can get to the bottom of this and understand what's now just ahead of us. I've been plugging the uh, Trumpet Magazine, the latest issue, After America, the post-American world, what happens next. Make sure that you um, get online and, and uh, become a subscriber to the Trumpet Magazine. Also, the latest uh, Trumpet Weekly, you can see there the feature, The Fight for Ukraine by uh, Brad McDonald. And um, on the upcoming Key of David, my father uh, has told me he's going to be getting into that subject, uh, the Ukraine here in, uh, in the near future. That's a huge story, a huge development there in the Ukraine with, uh, you know, right between Russia and the emerging power in Europe. So that's the Trumpet Weekly, the Trumpet Magazine, and of course the booklet, South Africa and Prophecy. And, and keep in mind that all the literature that we offer on our website or that you can receive by calling um, our offices is sent to you free of charge without any cost or obligation. Thank you for joining us today and we'll see you next time on the Trumpet Daily. <laughs>